on campus here in our site. So we're very excited about that partnership as well. So that's the, uh, we're here, we're here in this building then across the way, across the campus is a Boys and Girls Club headquarters. So between the whole East and West part of our campus, we've got a lot of different nonprofit and service areas really um, covered. And that's the whole point that if I'm working at the Literacy Center and I have a family that needs some health care, I can walk them right downstairs to Harrisburg Family Health and do that warm handoff where I can let them know who to contact, who, and then the, the facility can see who they are. And so it's not just, oh, go call this number, but I can actually walk them down there. So, I, and I've done that on a couple of occasions. So that's the overview of um, the hub. And as I said, I work for the Augusta University Literacy Center. That's a proud partner here at the hub. Thank you for that. that Betsy, I want to just make sure. Okay, now um, we have one more very distinguished guest on the line that we'd like to give a few minutes to, to address the group. We have Paul Ford, the president of the National Federation of Poetry Societies. Paul, are you down in De uh, Daytona? Unmute. Unmute. You're muted, Paul. Can you unmute? Yeah. There. Yeah. Sorry. Thank. Thank you. Yes, I'm in the Daytona Beach Shores, which is actually right on the uh, ocean, and they they suffered some from Hurricane Ian, uh, but uh, not not so much that we pulled our uh, our new first ever slam competition here at Daytona Beach. What, what we're doing is bringing 40 competitors who are prize money. So this is not, not a typical uh, like type Type slam. This this is uh, a high a high national level competition, and uh, we've had two rounds, Thursday night and Friday night, of preliminaries, and then we'll have uh, tonight the final. So we'll have twelve poets who will uh, go up and and uh, uh, present their three minute uh, uh, slam poem, and we end up with a with a ranking of, the, of those. So this is, um, this has been funded by a generous donation from uh, a New Mexico poet. His name's Phil Peach. And um, it, it's a way to reach out and, and connect with younger poets primarily and we're just so happy to have this response uh, and, and able to do this. Um, this year, we're holding the, this, this SLAM competition in conjunction with uh, the Florida State Poets Association's annual convention, also being held here in Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, next, this next year, we're holding our annual convention, a national convention in Des Moines, Iowa at the end of June. And uh, the hotel's already been selected. But that, that convention, we will integrate our the, the 2023 SLAM competition with the convention. And so it will be just one really extensive, uh, enjoyable, learn both about performance as well as, as page poetry. Um, I don't have anything specific other than that as a, as a national society, we are really just here to understand how we can help Georgia as well as the other state societies. And 
I'm open to questions, whether you want to ask uh, here in the Zoom or if you want to uh, connect with Lucinda and then email me, either way. Uh, I'm interested in what you guys are doing, so I will stay on, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll end my talk there. Thank you. Are there any questions for Paul? Okay, well, that's good. Paul was clear about everything. We, uh, I'll take it back to Lucinda, who will introduce our presenter and uh, workshop uh, developer, whatever. Uh, Lucinda, you ready? Sure, George, sure. yes. Thank you. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Marquise Williams, um, who's getting ready to do a workshop with us today. Um, without going into, I'm gonna let him um, introduce himself more as he gets into the workshop. I just wanna say that uh, I met Marquise about uh, sometime this year and when I heard that there was no poetry in Savannah. And uh, what people didn't realize is that uh, it was either last year, he was named Artist of the Year by the state of Georgia. And uh, if you want proof, this is the magazine in which his uh, article is featured. And so without further ado, because we, we did do an awesome interview with him as well, I give you Marquise Williams. Hello, how's everybody doing? Great, we're good. All right, beautiful, beautiful. All right, so uh, I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be moving around a little bit. Um, I'm gonna try and not have my head cut off. Uh, but so like here we go. Let me, let me test where I can go here. Boom. I am okay. So if I touch this, I'm decapitated. All right, so there we go. So it's uh it's nice to uh, be here. Uh, it's been a uh, it was it was a great trip uh, getting here. Uh, and first of all, I want to thank Miss Lucinda for uh, inviting me out. Um, William sending some, uh, sending the emails and getting me, getting me all together. Uh, Miss Betsy as well. Uh, definitely appreciate you for opening your doors. Um, this is a beautiful center uh, for y'all virtually. Y'all are missing out, uh, but we still gonna, we, we still gonna, you know, give the energy and push the energy through the screen. Uh, so it's beautiful. Um, but uh, like uh, Miss Lucinda said, uh, that uh, my name is Marquise Williams, uh, and I am a poet. Um, and uh, more, more even than that, I like to just say that I'm a storyteller um, because I love telling stories. Uh, I believe that stories are uh, some of the most valuable things on this earth, more valuable than money, more valuable than any of those things because we literally, we countries go to war over stories even. So uh, it's, uh, I just, I love stories. I love uh, researching and even just creating my own stories today. Um, so today we're we're going to be doing a little bit of writing. So uh, I actually uh, want to give you all a few minutes if you don't already um, find you a writing utensil uh, as well as something to write with, uh, and then um, also see if you can get you something to drink. Uh, you know, some water or something just to have right there next to you. Um, and this doesn't even have to be something that you. Um, yeah, there you go. I see you got the tea, Big G. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, I got my I got my bottle of water right here. So we are all good. I'm right there with y'all. And even if it's not a, a water that you're going to drink and you just want to have a, a piece of uh, the elements next to you. Um, so whether that element is, uh, you know, maybe you want to burn an incense, um, you know, get that element going. Uh, so whatever it's going to take to create a safe space for yourself, wherever you are, that's what I want y'all to do. So just going to give y'all a few seconds to do that. And then we're going to get started. And while everybody's still getting together, uh, I can see I can see your your images and everything up on the screen. Um, so once you have all of your materials, if you can just throw a thumbs up 
I'm gonna see if I can do it here from, if you could give me a thumbs up just like this. You see, I got a thumbs up right there in the corner. Or you could even drop it in the chat. Um, definitely want y'all to feel free to use the chat as well um, because I'll be, um, I'll be looking at those and uh, answering your questions and trying to stay in contact with y'all. So I got the chat open now, so it is official. All right, we're gonna wait for a few more people. So today we're going to be we're going to be exploring the power of poetry. Uh, we're here at the university, uh, the Augusta Uni uh, University Liter Literacy Center, um, and you know we're we're talking about literacy and the power of literacy. Um, and my my foundation is in poetry um, and specifically spoken word poetry. So a lot of times I use uh, this this spoken word poetry um to kind of reimagine or take back uh, the narrative uh and have the power to even just tell my own story so today we're going to be exploring all of these things so i want to read something for you all real quick and it's kind of just an overview so it says um since before we were given the boot and forced out of our mother's womb society has made it necessary to adorn us with names labels, titles. Why? These three words have helped shape the world and can sometimes determine anything from who we will become, where we can and cannot go, personality, traits, and even down to what color or sex we are supposed to be attracted to. All right. Some humans have even adopted these names and, and titles, these, this practice as a sort of defense mechanism to protect themselves from danger or others. Here today, we're gonna to confront these names, these labels and these titles that have propelled us forward, held us back or boxed us in, all right? And today we're gonna to be doing this through the art of poetry and through the art of storytelling. So we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna take you all through a quick process. So if y'all can have your pens and your papers out, I'm gonna ask you to do this. Real quick, I want you to write down at least two names, titles, or um, yeah, just two names or titles that you've been given in your lifetime, all right? And this could be something that you won. Uh, this can be a title that was maybe given to you and you didn't want this title. Uh, yeah, and can anybody think of a title along the lines of that? A title somebody gave you that you didn't want? <laughs> Listen to Simpson, no, no. Next question. All right, so in... So this is one, have one that, uh, a title that you, you fought for, a title that you, you really wanted in your life, and then have one title that you didn't want in your life, all right? So you should have two titles on your, um, on your page. So after you have those two titles, next, I want you to put with those titles, uh, what what personalities are associated with those titles? What are expected of these titles? So for instance, uh, maybe you put mother on there or maybe you put father on there. What are some, what are some uh, traits that's associated with a mother? What are some traits associated or even some, some skills or um, some jobs? So you want to attach a behavior, and this you can even attach a stereotype to this as well, too. All right, so what is a, a stereotype attached to this, to this label? And I'm going to give y'all an example. And then um, uh, today, too, I know it's a lot of us, uh, we, we haven't, uh, a lot of us we've never met before. Uh, and today, by the end of this session, I want us all to, like, we're going to be friends. Uh, we, we, we going out to dinner after this. Uh, we don't know each other's social security number and like all that. We're going that far. We're going that far. But um, we, we, we want to make sure we want to create a space to where we, we can all just learn about each other and, um, and find those areas of, of commonality. So I'm going to share uh, what I wrote down. Um, so for my title, um, one thing that uh, a title or label that has been um, 
kind of given to me, uh, light skin. All right. Uh, so like I, I've been called light skin. All right. Um, so behaviors or assumptions common, commonly attached to this title. Uh, bougie. All right. So like a lot of people say, oh, you like skin, you bougie. All right. You think you better than, than everybody else. Uh, something else is that you're a pretty boy or a pretty girl. Um, so that is also associated with uh, being light skin. People automatically think that I don't go outside and get my hands dirty or that I don't get dirt underneath my fingernails. Um, another thing that I have on here is soft. Um, got good hair and thinks that they are better than darker skin. All right. So these are all these are all things that are associated. Does does this make them true? Just because uh, it's associated with these titles? No. no. Okay. All right. All right. So, would anybody else like to share uh, some of the things that they have? And it could be either uh, out here or in the virtual world. And you could post it in the chat too if you don't want to uh, come off mute. What's that? I'll, I'll, I'll put something down because it, okay. it, it, it was so encouraging. I put down uh, not personality traits, but two titles that are fairly recent for me. Yeah. One that was uh, president, which I love. I love this job. I'm not on camera, am I? <laughs> <laughs> and um, filmmaker. It's something that I uh, wanted to do in the back of my mind, mm -hmm. and I've had a chance to actually uh, see it come to fruition. And uh, I, I put down the, the traits that, um, that are associated with both of them are that you are organized, that you are a leader, that you're strong, and that you are male. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that last, yeah, that last one hit. Yeah, yeah. you're right. So, thank you for sharing. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing. All right, and uh, Lucinda, uh, we're going to do it like this. Um, we're actually, you're going to pass the torch to the next person. So it can either either be uh, to our virtual participants or our live participants. Let's get to it. Hold up a book if you have something written down that I can pick it. Betsy. <laughs> well, from a very young age, this is the negative thing. I was thought of, or I got the label as the smartest girl in the class. Okay. So I remember starting first grade, the teachers, you know, and I remember that was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of people kind of distance. There was competition with other people in the class. And I felt a little bit like an imposter because it, I didn't really work that hard. It, it, it was sort of like, a, it was a strange thing to have as my identity. Conversely, more positive, I'm a professor and I did work hard at that. And so I no longer feel like an imposter. Like it took me a long time in my life to come up that I really earned it. And um, it was a little bit of a gender thing too, because they're, you know, as I got older, I was the only mm -hmm. female in my class. So, but anyways, it was kind of two sides to it. There was a time in my life when I actually felt it was isolating and a lot of pressure. And I was way more than just that, right? I was an athlete, I was a good friend, I was a lot of other things. But now I sort of embrace it in the sense that I've come, I've just turned 60 and I just feel now that I'm literally earned it, earned that title. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm the smartest girl in the class, but my point is I worked hard to get to a point where I don't feel like an imposter. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Thank you for sure. Thank you for sure. There's three in the chat. Um, oh. Who has, is it booked up that we have something to talk about? Yes. Yeah, and then we do have uh, we have Jill Jennings and Angie who uh, who wrote something. Angie. Um, I tap Angie if she's willing. Okay. So Angie said, uh, I have been called Grace because I am clumsy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that person's a poet, most definitely. <laughs> nice. Thank you for sharing, Angie. Uh, Jill also said, uh, a linguist, uh, a Renaissance woman. Um, an artist, a journalist, uh, Delante, uh, tell me how to say that word, Delatante. 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 There we go. All right. There we go. All right. There we go. All right. Nice. Who's that? Uh, that's George. He just said, okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so now that you can names. pick one in here. Four eyes. Oh, four okay. Eyes. Okay. Look, I, I've been called that too. Um, in middle school, I had, uh, when I first uh, 
had to wear glasses. Uh, I had Nintendo 64 glasses uh, and they were really pretty, they were pretty thick. Uh, but this was before everybody was okay with coming out and saying that they were nerds. So uh, I was picked on my whole life uh, pretty much for those. And then now that I'm older, those same kids who were picking on me are wearing like Nintendo 64 <laughs> shirts and <laughs> like all kinds of paraphernalia of Nintendo 64. And it's like, yo, uh, but okay, cool. Yes, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, and somebody else in here? Uh, so one of the ones I chose was Crybaby. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I um, wrote down some traits associated with it. It's too sensitive um, and not allowed to uh, be emotional, show emotion. Um, and as a juxtaposition, I also wrote down strong Black women, uh, which is also not allowed to show emotion, not allowed to be emotional, um, but also um, people associate that as never needing help, mm -hmm. um, never being allowed to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And let's get one more person. Uh, yeah, let's get one more person uh, from virtual land. Do we just jump in? Yes, you can just jump in. Uh, you picked up mine with four eyes. That was uh, in the fifth grade when they discovered I couldn't see, mm. which is news to me because I thought I could. <laughs> anyway, uh, so because I wore glasses, everybody assumed I would become a scientist. I did not. Mm. They assumed I was a stumbler, fumbler uncoordinated and usually out to lunch. Whereas one of my ex-wives would say, Earth to George. <laughs> I love it. Thank you for sharing, George. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So there's some things I want us to, uh, to be thinking about uh, from, from these questions, OK? Uh, and this is, uh, I, I've done this, this exercise with, with young people all the way up to adults, because I think it's very important uh, in, in society, especially in today's society, uh, we as humans, we put so much emphasis on labels, on titles, on all of these different things. Uh, like you, Lucinda, you said it, where it's certain titles where uh, we're told that if we don't meet these criteria, then we can't be these things. Uh, and a lot of times, even when we call ourselves certain things, then that almost stops us from becoming anything more. So uh, th these are just some, uh, a few critical questions that I want you all to think about before, uh, before I share our first uh, mentor text with you all. And then we're going to do a little bit uh, more writing on this topic of labels and, um, and even just reimagining what these labels are. So here's some questions I want y'all to think about. Some of you have already been thinking about these, but do you connect or disconnect to the associated traits that are attached to your labels that you wrote down? So and you can just think about it. So do you connect or disconnect from these things? Has this title had a, has a, has this title had a positive or negative effect on how you view yourself and others? All right, so how has this title changed the way that you even perceive the world around you? All right, how does this, uh, who does this name give power to? But if we're asking who this name gives power to, then we also have to think about who does this name take power from? All right, so think about all of these things. Uh, how does this title make you feel and why? And then our last one is, have you ever had to prove that this label title or name belongs or doesn't belong to you? If so, how did you prove it? And was it worth proving? All right. And y'all don't have to answer any of these technically right now. Um, but these questions are something that I want you all to dive deep in. And if it does birth a, a story out of you, allow that to come out. Um, so real quick, um, we're going to watch a story. Uh, we're going to watch a piece by a really, really dope poet. Um, his name is E8, all right? Um, he has this really cool piece that's called I Am Not Black, I Am Not White. Um, and before you agree or disagree with anything, again, I just want you to listen to the piece and try and take in what he's saying and even apply these same concepts that he's talking about to the labels that you wrote down on your paper, all right? 
Um, and I have an assignment for you all too. Uh, as you're listening to this, I want you to see capture at least two of your favorite lines. All right, so two of your favorite lines, at least two lines that really stand out to you when you're listening to this piece. All right, here we go. I am not black. I mean, that's what the world calls me, but it's not me. I didn't come out of my mother's womb saying, hey, everybody, I'm black. No, I was taught to be black. And you were taught to call me that, along with whatever you call yourself. It's just a label. See, from birth, the world force feeds us these labels. And eventually, we all swallow them. We digest and accept the labels, never, ever doubting them. But there's one problem. Labels are not you and labels are not me. Labels are just labels. But who we truly are is not skin deep. See, when I drive my car, no one would ever confuse the car for me. But when I drive my body, why do you confuse me for my body? It's my body. Get it? Not me. Let me break it down. See, our bodies are just cars that we operate and drive around. The dealership we call society decided to label mine the black edition, yours the Irish or white edition. And with no money down, 0% APR and no test drive, we were forced to own these cars for the rest of our lives. Forgive me, but I fail to see the logic or pride in defining myself or judging another by the cars we drive. Because who we truly are is found inside. Listen, I'm not here to tell you how science has concluded that genetically we're all mixed and race in the human species doesn't exist or how every historian knows that race was invented in the 15th century to divide people from each other and it has worked perfectly. No, I'm not here to lecture. I just want to ask one question. Who would you be if the world never gave you a label? Never gave you a box to check? Would you be white, black, Mexican, Asian, Native American, Middle Eastern, Indian? No, we would be one. We would be together. No longer living in the era of calling human beings black people or white people. These labels that will forever blind us from seeing a person for who they are, but instead seeing them through the judgmental, prejudicial, artificial filters of who we think they are. And when you let an artificial label define yourself, then my friend, you have chosen smallness over greatness and minimized yourself, confined and divided yourself from others. And it is an undeniable fact that where there is division, there will be conflict, and conflict starts wars. Therefore, every war has started over labels. It's always us versus them. So the answer to war, racism, sexism, and every other ism is so simple that every politician has missed it. It's the labels. We must rip them off. Isn't it funny how no baby is born racist, yet every baby cries when they hear the cries of another? No matter the gender, culture, or color, proving that deep down we were meant to connect and care for each other. That is our mission, and that is not my opinion. That is the truth in a world that has sold us fiction. Please listen, labels only distort our vision, which is why half of those watching this will dismiss it or feel resistance and conflict it. But just remember, so did the caterpillar before it broke through its shell and became the magnificent butterfly. Well, these labels are our shells, and we must do the same thing so we can finally spread our wings. Human beings were not meant to be slapped with labels like groceries and supermarkets. DNA cannot be regulated by the FDA. We were meant to be free, and only until we remove them all and stop living and thinking so small will we be free to see ourselves and each other for who we Truly, oh. So what can we do in the face of all? Really, really lovely. Boom. Yes, y'all snap it up, clap it up, Hey, how y'all, how y'all like that piece? Okay. Yeah, it was a really nice piece. Uh, really, really, really uh, profound. Um, and he he talked about some some really cool things. 
um, this this idea of a labelless world, even. Um, and so I, I want to ask you all, like, what would be what would be the cons of a labelless world? Because like he kind of talked about the the pros. It's like oh, everybody kind of coming together. Da, 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 da. But just be a devil's advocate. What would be the cons? Hmm. Y'all can't think. Ooh, this is good if y'all can't. Look. If we're talking about racial ones, I can't see any cons to getting rid of all those. Now, if you're talking about if if you work for 20 years to get the label professor, I think that's legit. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, she she earned it. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, somebody on here was about to say something. Was it was it you, Jill? Yeah. And what was your question? What, what were some of the bad things about labels? Uh, yes. Like, uh, so what, what, what would be some of the cons if, if we had a labelless world? Well, if we had a labelless world, people would have a real hard time figuring out who to hate. <laughs> they could probably manage it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you'd have to find some other way to, to, to distinguish people. Yes, 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 yes. All right. So uh, this is, uh, I, I want to give us the opportunity to write a little bit uh, because, again, we, all of us have been, uh, have had labels attached to us, <laughs> even me, myself. Uh, even me, myself, calling, calling myself a, a poet or calling myself an educator. That that still um, it's it's a beautiful thing. I've worked hard for this. I've I've learned so much. I've met so many amazing people. However, I'm not just an educator, um, and it gets to the point to where we we have to understand kind of what he said. These labels are something that is man made. Uh, we're we're not necessarily man made. So it, what man made things can't contain who we are, uh, and this goes for who who you are as well. So it's like. Uh, Betsy is like, yes, you'll always be this professor, but at the same time, you're still so much more than a professor because there's no there's no English word or word a word that exists that can define who you are to this world. All right. So when we're breaking labels, we're breaking the boundaries to say that what man has created, we we can go beyond that, and we can reimagine that when we tell our stories, when we start to to see, uh, tell the stories of our ancestors, tell the stories. And when I say ancestors, I'm not just talking, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. No, like even your, your grandparents who are no longer here, or maybe they are still living, um, different things that you picked up from them, uh, these labels or those things are also carried inside as well. Uh, okay, gotcha. I see Paul just sent a direct message. He said he had to go. Appreciate you for, uh, for coming, Paul. So this is what we're going to do. We are going to reimagine our labels ourselves, okay? So who would we be without our labels? And something else we could even explore in this piece is um, who, who do we want to become? All right, what, what labels do we, do we want to have? Or uh, if we had a... And I'm, I'm saying it a, a couple of different ways because I don't want to uh, I don't want to tell y'all exactly what to write. I want y'all to feel free to feel inspired um, to write however you feel from it. And that's why I never give direct prompts, um, because even if I give a direct prompt, I still want you to feel free to write in the way or, or respond in the way that you feel is best for you. Um, so we're going to write real quick, real quick, uh, just on redefining and reimagining our labels and who we are. Okay, so let's take about, we're gonna say five minutes. We're gonna say five soul minutes. So that might be five minutes, but then that might be two minutes. Uh, we, we're gonna see. Put more jazz on for us.
start finding my stopping place. Got about 10 seconds left. How's everybody feeling? Everybody feel still feeling good? We're enjoying ourselves so far. We felt like that was a good deep dive. All right. Nice. Nice. All right. Would anybody like to share? And for our folks in here, if you would like to share, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna put y'all on the spot too. I'm gonna ask that y'all come up here and read for our uh, our virtual guests. Y'all look. Y'all y'all actually got the good seats in the house. Um, like I. <laughs> So y'all, y'all gonna get the front row show right here, okay? Um, so would anybody like to go first? Oh, I don't have enough to rip. Oh no, that's, that's, there is no such thing. Even if it's just one line, that's perfectly fine. All right, so y'all clap it up, clap it up, and then we'll have to go next. We got our first intelligence, Trish. All right, clap it up, Trish. You know, when I when I first had my first job as a legal, I'm an attorney, but when I was a legal clerk before I graduated from law school, I had a job for the summer, and uh, I found out that the guys in the office used to call me the China doll, and so I felt like you know that was obviously a stereotype based on how I looked, and it affected how I behaved at work later because what I would do sometimes is make sure that I like threw in a curse word or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be natural around me, you know, because they assumed I was this prissy little trying to doll. So I wanted to let them know I wanted to be let in to the group. You know, I didn't want to be held out on some pedestal, you know, like a prissy little woman. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you for sure. Who wants to go next? We'll let you pick the next person. All right, let's talk about let's talk about let's talk about. Um, so similar, my my label was too sensitive. Um, crybaby would fit too. Um, but I'm reimagining the label of possibly alchemist or magician, alchemist in the sense that um, they really try to take violence and turn it into beauty through language, hopefully, um, or defeat into hope. And then magician in the sense of taking um, lies, maybe, and you know, doing the proverbial sawing the lies in half and trying to find truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Do we have anybody from the virtual world who would like to share? George, well. Yes. All right, uh, George, take us away. So when we were uh, some minutes ago uh, talking about how we are seen by others, I was wondering if a monarch butterfly do understands the other species or does she even care? Mm -hmm. So uh, using that uh, theme of the monarch, I wrote, if I am not a monarch, may I have not a throne? Would I live without a realm or see the world without ego involvement? or be, uh, I can't read my own writing, or be in the world only as a passerby, moving through the day as myself only, making memories like the ones others have. So, they do not define me as a member of a kingdom and free me from, as I am free myself, from expectations, from obligations, from profound recitations. That's it. It's rough. 
I, I love uh, your wordplay on, um, you know, taking it from the butterfly of the monarch to taking it to the monarch as far as like the leader or the king, uh, which is uh, which is really cool. Anybody else? Would anybody else like to share? I want to make sure I'm giving space uh, for everybody's voice. It's kind of disjointed, but yeah. All right, we got enough participants. Let's clap it up for them. Clap it up. Um, well, I, I wrote down my thoughts, and um, I'll probably fashion them into a poem later on. But I was thinking about who would we be? And I was... At first I thought, well, I'm loving and I'm funny. And I thought, no, those words define, don't they? They they really give me a label. Why can't we use colors or music? Um, use other parameters to define. Why can't we use textures like um, shiny or flat or nubby or sparkly? And then I ended with, isn't everything subjective? Nice. Thank you. Okay. okay. Clap it up, clap it up. Okay. Um, so I kind of had the same idea. I kind of just wrote um, almost like a stream of consciousness. Yeah. Um, so I said, I would make labels more open-ended, more childlike, more versatile with multiple meanings. Just because I'm strong doesn't mean I can't be soft or have weak moments. Just because I cry doesn't mean I can't laugh tomorrow. As humans, we are in a constant state of change and should feel free to move in and out of whatever labels we want. They should be able to mean more than one thing. We are multidimensional, and that's how labels should be looked at as multidimensional. And so there was a, a reason that I, I really wanted us to, to do this exercise uh, today, um, because as an artist, is um, you know, so I just one, uh, like uh, Ms. Lucinda said, I, I just got this title of being a uh, recipient of the Georgia Governor's Award, right? Uh, and like, it's, it's a really great title. Um, and I, I definitely worked really, really hard to get it. Um, and then more, more so than often, well, more so now uh, than I guess uh, before that, um, now I'm, I'm really going through a state of uh, reflection. And it's been, uh, it's important as artists uh, or and even as writers that we continue to go through this state of reflection to see who we, who we are becoming, um, what the things that we've been through and how they shape the way that we view the world. Um, so that's kind of where, uh, why I wanted us to do this today because I'm definitely in a space now to, it's like, you know, I've done all of these amazing things. I've done, I've met all of these, you know, amazing people um, but what now? Does this really define who I am? Am I, am I capable of more? Or does this, does, you know, this label or does this title um, make me have to work even harder to prove that I, I deserve that? And like all of these other things, feeling that the, the sense of imposter syndrome and like all of those things. Um, so that's why I wanted us, to, I wanted to share this, this moment with you all too, um, so that you also can have this space of reflection um, and we can see like who we are and the things that we've done to get to where we are. And then to even to say that, hey, none of that even matters. Like I could, I could start over all from scratch again and it would, it would still be okay. I would still be me at the end of the day. Um, you could strip all of these labels from me and like you will still get my, my pure soul. Um, and that's why I wanted to, to share this. So I hope y'all enjoyed this and I hope this um, this uh, uh, listening to Prince EA's poem, as well as exploring your own labels that you've had in your in your waking life, 
Um, I, ho I hope that has helped you to, uh, to, I hope that inspires new pieces. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, so uh, I felt like I was, I was starting to ramble. Um, I wanted to, uh, I want to open the floor now for any questions, any epiphanies, or just ideas that came up uh, during uh, during today's presentation. Um, so it could be anything, or even if you just want to um, tell me about your day too, uh, <laughs> how's your day gone so far? Uh, we could we could talk about all those things. All right. About the label you got with uh, artist of the year. The thing is that with poets you sort of need some kind of label to get doors open to you. So yeah. many um, people running journals or whatever, they're unsure of their own artistic vision and they're afraid to pick something just because they like it, you know? And so they're looking for a credential mm -hmm. to hang their heads. Oh, I'll put this one in because she's been published here and here mm -hmm. or she has won this award or that award. And so it's really about how the culture feels its way to open doors to people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what a degree. Now, some young people are saying, I don't need a degree. I can learn what I need to know uh, on the internet. My daughter has taught herself certain sciences that she didn't even study in college. And I'm saying, but don't you need to go get a master's or something? Because mm -hmm. the people who are going to hire you, they're looking for that little piece of paper. And she said, I don't have time or money to spend on that. You know, I just want to learn what I want to learn, you know? And so that's an idealistic way to look at it. And I hope the world is morphing in that direction, but I don't know if it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. Um, hear me at all. I'm not used to this computer. I got you. Am I? Uh, I'm not Elizabeth. I'm Gloria. Okay. I'm using my daughter's computer, and she <laughs> don't know who I am. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to say that you come to a point in your life, and I'm there, where you're at peace with your labels. Okay. All my life, I've been short. Okay. And now it doesn't really matter to me. Okay. The most important thing is the know who you are and the person that's inside you. And I don't like to look at people with labels either. You know, um, I've been a teacher and I've always tried to look at the person, you know, and try to tailor things for that person, not who I think they are. And I just wanted to share that with you, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Jill. Um, we were talking about labels we don't want. Um, I don't think there's a label for what I am, but I'm tired of people saying she's the one married to that guy, that Asian guy. We don't know what kind he is. Yeah. And I'm tired of asking people asking me where did he come from? What part of China did he come from? He didn't come from China. I'm tired of nobody knowing where Malaysia is or how to spell it. <laughs> you mean well, but people are very uncomfortable if you don't put everybody in a box. Mm -hmm. They're very uncomfortable. They feel like somehow their world is chaotic. And we all do that. I'm listening to people. I'm, I'm kind of a linguist. And I'm listening. Is that Spanish or Portuguese? I think that's Portuguese. I have to know. And that's what I'm working on. Why do I have to know? Why, why do people have to know what he is? Everybody likes him, but, and then there, then one of my students said, why, why'd you have to marry him? Why couldn't you find a white man <laughs> to marry? I was so shocked. I wasn't offended because they're stupid, they're stupid, you know. They, they grew up in the country. They've never even seen an Asian person. But living with a different culture, somebody else with a different culture, you learn real quick how sensitive they are to labels and things that you would never think would upset them do upset them. Well, that's all I have to say. You have to be, listen more and say less when you're around a different culture or somebody from a different culture because they're going to do things you think are so rude, but they're, but they're not. not. They're not. Are they gonna, we're going to do things that we think are so nice, but they'll end up in tears. 
And if, if you're lucky to be married to somebody who tell you why, that's helpful. But usually you're not going to find out why. Mm. So anyway, microaggression says it's a uh, happy. That's right. Yeah, and I, I definitely love that. Um, you, you brought up a lot of uh, really, really cool points um, and everything. So thank you for sharing, Jill. Um, and uh, what, I, what I love about it, too, is uh, everybody's bringing up um, things or uh, uh, obstacles that they've come up, uh, come to in their own life, in their own waking lives. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it reminds me that our, our social is inherently uh, political, like our, our social is just, it's tied to the political, it's tied to these systems, it's tied to these labels, even when we think it's not. Yes, ma'am. It's also tied to gender. Yes. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, sex too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And, um, and like you said, it's, it's some people out there who uh, they... Uh, they need these labels in order in order to survive, and I think that uh, as writers and just even as artists, uh, we are in a a very special place because we kind of see we see it all. We see the spectrum that exists. Um, so you know, to quote uh, Spider Man, um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility because we are able to see these nuanced perspectives and see um, see what. I guess regular people, we could call them regular people, I guess, uh, <laughs> we're the mutants. Uh, what regular people don't often see or what they're not what they're not often thinking about. And this is again why it's important for us to uh, continue going through this constant state of reflection because through our own reflection, we come to these really great ideas and then we can go out and start these uh, start conversations that will get people talking about these things and saying, you know, hey, well, why do we depend so much on labels? Mm -hmm. What are what are some what is a new way that we can go of thinking about this? And then we get cool things of, you know, describing things through colors and textures and sounds and all of these other things. And that is that is truly the human experience. I feel like uh, we even the way that we learn, we don't just learn by by doing it one way. We learn by doing it multiple ways. We we need to feel it. We need to with our hands. We need to smell it. We need to see it. And then that's when it really sits. Um, so yeah, like uh, these these are awesome. Like y'all brought up some beautiful stories um, and maybe even think about some things that I I didn't think about. Um, so give yourselves a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to just add one thing that uh, Trish said, because I've sat on the other end as a person who's had to judge or make a decision about who gets published or who doesn't. That's a con. That's a con of labels. I mean, it's all good. You know what I mean? If you don't put any labels on it, if you have no qualifiers on it, if the person doesn't have any awards or they don't have anything to distinguish themselves, a, 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 a publisher or a journalist would, would never leave their room. So they're constantly going, oh, this is good. You know, you only have so much space, so much time. And uh, if it's all good, then 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 where, where, do, where do people strive to go to? I mean, how do you get to the next level if there's no markers? So I would think that that would be a con to like the, the whole thing of labeling. Well, quality is something different. Like, um, like as beginning poets, we hope to get better, right? Because you have to recognize the first poem that that anyone writes is not going to be what they're writing 20 years later. And, and it's certainly not going to compare to either Seamus Heaney or what, whoever you want to pick, mm -hmm. you know, to be a great poet. Um, so quality is a kind of label. I mean, not a kind of label, but discernment or discrimination. It's a word, but it used to be like determining a type of quality from another type of quality, you know. Um, discriminating about wine means you know something about wine for example you know um but words gosh that shows you how much power a word has, mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. or the word gay used to mean happy you know yep. <laughs> it wouldn't be nice if we just had an implied question mark next to every label mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> just like, with that in mind you know. yeah. well, and try baby question mark <laughs> <laughs> Talk about stereotypes. I remember that um, the guy who taught workshops at my house for a while when I was trying to learn, he was a good guy named Will Wright. He's well published, awarded. He said, 
don't call yourself a poet if somebody asks. Just say you're a writer, because if you call yourself a poet, they'll just assume you're conceited and shut up. <laughs> Actually, right. he thinks the general public thinks a poet. You know? Wow. And I, uh, so I, I've kind of started doing the same thing. Uh, at least I've been trying to get better with it. Um, because uh, so when people ask like, "What do I do?" Um, and I tell them, "Oh, I'm an artist." Um, and immediately, immediately they go to, "Oh, uh, visual art and do this and da 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 da." So that tells me what they think about uh, what they think about art. And then I say, "Oh, I do literary arts." And uh, I tell them, "You're a poet, you're theater, and like different things like that." Um, but trying to get out of telling people I'm just the poet. Yeah. Um, but it's like, at the same time, I don't want to list, oh, you know, well, I'm a martial artist, I'm a poet, uh, I, I'm a gardener, I'm a, you know, like you start listing off everything. Uh, so it's uh, kind of have to pick and choose which labels, uh, depending even on the person or the, the uh, whatever element you're in. Um, so yeah, the situation. All right, yeah, we got a few more minutes. Do we have any uh, questions and everything? And then, so, uh, just so y'all, I know uh, we're, we'll sure. just be taking a, a small break and then uh, we'll be coming back. And I have uh, I mean, some poems, um, some original books. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was mute this whole time. <laughs> no, we were kind of, it was working because when the, these people I was picking up. Okay. Okay. But now gotcha. you're good. You're back on you. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was, we, we had some technical difficulties, yeah. but y'all can still hear me. <laughs> Um, but yes, uh, so uh, we're, we're going to be taking a quick break, but um, I'll be coming back to uh, to read some original poems for you all um, and tell some stories. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but before we uh, close out, I pass it back over to Ms. Lucinda. Uh, is there anybody who has any questions or anything? Cool. Well, I hope you all enjoyed uh, this workshop. I definitely uh, appreciate you all for participating. And uh, it's still giving so much energy uh, through through the like I felt it through the camera like I literally uh, <laughs> like yeah like I feel you know like that, that was me feeling the energy I know it so um, I'm I'm sorry I'm a little weird uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but yes yeah, so I definitely appreciate y'all uh, for for having me um, I can't wait to share some um, some poems with you all. And uh, if y'all would like to, you can uh, follow me on social media at Here at Peace Speak. Um, I'll put that in the uh, in the chat. And yes, uh, thank y'all again. Okay. All right. Okay. So now's the time for us to. Uh, Marquise asked us to have a glass of water or a cup of coffee or something with us. Mm -hmm. Now is our time to uh, give that a back. Potty break. Potty, Potty break. break. <laughs> Potty break. Boys and girls, single file. <laughs> this is Marquise again. And he's going to be sharing with us some of his poetry and some storytelling. And... Uh, I am very much looking forward to this. So without further ado, here's Marquise. There we go. I was never the type to fit in. I was about... 13 with dreams of speaking to the masses, but I told my mama I wanted to be a fisherman. I told my mama I wanted to be like my father, who had hardly ever fathered me for reasons fathered him with what eyes could see. You see, my dad was labeled a dead man. And sometimes I would just sit back and think like, like, man, like, what would it be like to be like my father? And though in many ways my mom said we were one, I can't even think of one Reason to call myself your son, screaming. Reason I want to be your son, daddy. You know, I was only two when you left us. And I could, I could only imagine my mom's reaction to that package she received from your other means of satisfaction. You left two unnurtured seeds thirsty, lacking water. So my mom cried tears, filling buckets of salty water. The reason that every time I hear the word father, I can remember it's of how my mom feels and my greatest fear is somebody replacing me, daddy. I came home to hit it. My, my sister had had 
been thrown and, and raped by a minister, only 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 16 with no innocence, stolen by a man who my mother gave her vows to. And that day, I know that I can't blame you, but I blame you when you, at the age of 50, couldn't comprehend my pain. Forget what you've been through, Daddy. I, I love you. Because through it all, through all the miss Christmases and, and, and birthday parties, you still somehow taught me how to be a better man. You taught me how to protect and love when you're in the privilege of a lovely woman's hand. And I stand before you today to say that I have made it. Because of you, my words are not jaded, but heard, sensational and pure. The cure to my yesterdays and tomorrows. And daddy, I never got the chance to tell you how I really feel. You see, y'all, I was never the type of fit in. I was about 13 with, with dreams of speaking to the masses, of, of doing shows and, and touching hearts. You see, I was chosen to be a part of something bigger than me, but my pops, he was just so selfish. He never even took the time to, to get to know me. So now I just talk to random audiences on stages and tell them everything about me. So, hello, my name is Marquise. My favorite color is yellow because it reminds me of a brighter tomorrow and I'm a Leo with a roar big enough to support my ego and my favorite food is Cajun reminding me to spice up every occasion and occasionally, just occasionally, I want to be loved by my father who hardly ever fathered me for reasonings farther than what, what eyes can see for reasonings farther than what arms can reach and daddy, I love you. Even though you're not here with me, sincerely, your son, Marquise. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So hello, uh, my name is Marquise Williams and I am an artist. Uh, um, I, I love telling stories. Uh, I, um, so a lot of the poems that you're going to be hearing today uh, have not only personal stories, um, but also stories, uh, I brought a little bit of home with me. Um, so I'll also be uh, retelling some stories from Savannah as well. Um, I had the opportunity to work and have had the opportunity to work with uh, artists all across Georgia. And um, one thing that we really love doing is researching the stories that already exist that have been hidden and um, covered up. And then we take that data, we take that information, and then we, we repurpose it into spoken word pieces and tell it to the community so that way they can know the history of different locations and different things like that. So uh, to kind of demonstrate that a little bit and what that looks like, I'm going to be doing a piece entitled The Wind. Um, this is, again, uh, stories uh, from Savannah. Um, and it talks about, uh, you know, Savannah was, uh, is uh, in the like top five ports in, in the nation. And it has always been that way. And um, Savannah was a huge part of uh, the slave trade. Um, as well. So a lot of the enslaved uh, Africans were um, brought through Savannah. Um, one of the largest slave trades uh, um, in Georgia happened in Savannah, um, and it was called the Weeping Time, uh, which right now in Savannah, they are, um, there are elders who are literally right now fighting to protect that land because the Salvation Army is, uh, they bought the land that the largest slave trade happened on and they're trying to build a center there. Um, so right now the elders are working towards like trying to preserve that history and turn that space into a museum that continues to tell the story and uplift the memories of the people that were there. So um, the next piece I'm gonna be doing has a little, all, a little bit of all of that in there. So here we go. I can still feel the beat of the doom doom deep and dark. I can still see the sand vibrating on Angola's golden land as we dance. I can still hear praises as, as bodies wildly sing in unison, as hands raise in wind and crash with the wind and crash with the wind. 
and crash with the wind, I can still taste the clay on my lips. I can still see hips shake back and forth and crash and shake in the wind. I can still hear the talking drums ringing along in the wind, ringing along in the wind. And then those men showed up and stole mother, son, daughter, and all of our kin, but I can still hear the wind. I can still hear the chains rattling like, like tubo seeds caught in the wind. They, they silenced our hymns, so they would no longer be heard in the wind. Old souls rose like biddies in the wind. Ships stole with our kin, sailed with the wind. Salt, sweat, and death mixed with the wind so much till it hurt to breathe in. The Akan, Medenka, Mali, Gambia, and even Sierra Leone shared this voyage we were on. And for days and months that seemed to last way too long, our fragile bodies would, would crash into neighboring skin from the Atlantic storms and when the beast had gone. Those that lay still were, were given to the ocean to feed on so much so that I know that we sailed on the blood of our very own, but I can still hear the wind. I can still hear the waves crashing in the wind. I can still hear the chains rattling like, like two gold seeds caught in the wind. I can still hear those men talking about taking the disease to Tybee's West End. They said there was a place there called Lazaretto, also known as the Pest House. You see, we had nothing left now. No name, no village, just chains and back stained with anger like we would have blamed and taken to Savannah City Market to be exchanged for change. Everything just changed, but listen. Listen, if you listen real close, you can still hear the wind. You can still feel the beat of the doom doom ringing deep and dark. You can still see the sand vibrating on Angola's golden land as we dance. And you can still hear praises through rhythmic phrases as bodies wildly sing as bodies wildly crash with the wind. Thank you. So uh, as I said, that was a, a research piece. Uh, basically uh, took a, a lot of different um, histories and stories from Savannah. Um, so uh, a lot of the slave trade also happened in Savannah City Market, which is probably one of the most like um, touristy spots in Savannah right now. Um, so, and there, there has been millions of dollars that has been pumped into that area to make it look nice. Um, and everything that they've done to make it look nice uh, doesn't necessarily talk about the atrocities that happened in that in that same space, the families that were split up, and so on and so on. Um, also. Uh, Tybee Island um, was a huge part of the Middle Passage. Uh, there was a place there called Lazaretto, which is French for pest house. Um, so literally, uh, after the enslaved had come on this long journey um, for months, barely eating, uh, eating, uh, sleeping in their own feces and, and everything else, uh, any of them who were sick or, in, or getting ready to die, die, they were taken to the pest house. Um, which is where they would pretty much spend the rest of their lives. Um, so these are all things that happen in Savannah, and there are there are locals who are from our city who were born there, raised, and they don't even know these stories. So it's important that we we retell these stories and that we tell these stories so that people know where we came from, so that way we can know where we're going. All right, I'm getting a little chilly on the. Uh, Sip some coffee real quick. Hopefully, I don't speed through this next poem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but if y'all would be still, say yeah. Yeah. Say oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right, cool. So, um, my um, my mom, she's not quite here yet, but um, she's coming down from Atlanta, and uh, she's going to be bringing some uh, some shirts. Uh, and the next poem that I'm going to be reading was inspired, or the next poem I'm going to be reading inspired these shirts. Um, now, I do want to 
give a little backstory behind this poem uh, and how it how it came about. Um, so I, I started doing spoken word poetry seriously uh, about 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago is also when a man by the name of Clinton D. Powell uh, passed away. Um, he was my mentor and he was one of the co-founders of the Spitfire Poetry. He is uh, one of the reasons why I call myself a spoken word artist today and that uh, he's one of the biggest reasons why I'm able to stand before you today and do and tell my stories. He was the first person to sit down and, uh, and tell me, hey, you have a story and your story matters. Your story can, your story can change somebody's life. Um, and as I've grown older, uh, I, I started to believe that more and more. But uh, 10 years ago, uh, he passed away due, due to cancer. Um, and he was an amazing poet. He was a, a director, a playwright. Um, and again, his name was Clinton D. Powell. Um, so before he passed away, um, he, uh, he was in the hospital for about a month. Um, and during that time, uh, he couldn't write. His, his body was so weak, he could barely talk. Um, he lost a lot of weight and everything else. But he still wanted to, to do poetry. He still wanted to read, write, and, and just create poetry. And all of these ideas were coming to him when he was, when he, he didn't know he was on his deathbed, but when he was on his deathbed. And um, he had a recorder. And on that recorder, he started to record um, as many poems as he could before he passed away. And when he passed away, that recorder made it into my hands. Um, there was a piece on that recorder that uh, it was titled Feed Me Poetry. And in the piece, uh, on the recorder, you can hear him saying it. Um, he, he, he couldn't eat at the time. He couldn't keep food down and all of these things. And he said, water is nice, but I can't drink water. Food is nice, but I can't eat food. So feed me poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what inspired this thing. Gifts are nice. Flowers are nice and food will do the body nice. Yeah, yeah, you're right, but listen. Listen, 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 Linda, listen, listen. Y'all listening? Mm -hmm. Y'all listening? Mm -hmm. In the virtual world, y'all listening? Mm -hmm. Okay. All I need right now is a plate of pros from some pros. You get what I'm saying? No? Well, that sucks, because you see, that's the only thing that's truly going to fill my soul. Oh, oh, and don't forget my side stands the season with metaphors. I need to smell it before I even walk through the door. I don't want no preservatives. Artificial colors or high fructose corn syrup, I need that organic. I need it marinated in lived experiences. I need it kneaded like dough in the mind's kitchen and set aside to rise on a notepad. I need it baked at 350 degrees under theater in small coffee house lamps, grilled by fiery eyes, filled with hope, seared by snaps, by claps, and occasional knee slaps, and topped off with a salt-based sprinkle of laughter, of tears, and even a little bit of madness at y'all. I wouldn't even be mad if a little garlic and onion powder was added to the mix. Mm -hmm. I can smell it right now, the, the smell of natural deodorants, incense, Egyptian musk, and Palo Santo six mixing in the air. If you haven't figured out by now my hints, I want you to feed me poetry. Feed me and I, I still will need more. My hunger can't be tamed. My palate desires the most distinguished diction delivered to my doorstep. <laughs> Lord Dash, I want ballads at my bedside. Bring me a seat of war makes soliloquies garnished with wild lilies plucked from Shakespeare's garden and, and for dessert, an overripe eulogy to celebrate another soul set free. Feed me poetry. Washed with fire hoses in Birmingham, Alabama. Then home to dry on old solid oaks. I want it deep dipped in batter. Fried in hair grease with a hot comb on a southern porch in Georgia. Glazed in beach pastoral wordplay. Baptized in honeysuckle haikus. Feed me poetry that's sweet with a hint of earthiness. Poetry powdered in pain and waiting for you to bite down to reveal its creamy feeling of healing. Poetry that's spicy with a, with a little mark. Twain to it. Twain. Poetry so good. <laughs> I got it, I got it. Poetry so good. I should make the old to it. Old poetry. 
Your sestina straddle the breeze like a gallant steed, peels the sycamore clean the way its roots run deep and borrows heat from the earth's core. You get a new jewel every time you dare to bite down and add pressure. Feed me poetry from the earth's inner mountains where the ancient forests grow and the giants roam where they keep dragons as pets. I don't want it unless it's FX, red and dramatic effects, ladies and Gentlemen, get ready for the time of your life in a world where mics are less steaming hand and voices crackle like bacon popping knowledge from speakers heating noggins on lyrical stove tops. Well done folks who dance on taste buds and trigger uncontrollable head nods. Feed me poetry and serve me my verses hot or don't serve me nothing at all. What? <laughs> Thank y'all, thank y'all. So um, I know I told this like uh, semi uh, sad story about um, about Mr. Powell. Uh, however, he y'all he was a he was a character, um, and I couldn't allow myself um, I couldn't allow myself to to write this poem and not put humor in it because that that was the person he was, and even in that moment when he was. He was, he was, he literally did not know that he wasn't going to make it that, or be here this ne that next month. And in that moment, he was still being funny. He was still like trying to push the bar and finding joy in, inside of all of this pain that he was experiencing. Um, so that's kind of what inspired that piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, how are we doing on time? Bye. Keep going. Okay, cool. Um, so. This next piece is somewhat of a, a longer piece, um, but we talked a little bit uh, uh, earlier about honoring our ancestors or honoring the ones before us because um, they, so much of them exist in us today, even small things that we might not notice um, that we do, uh, they're, they're just these small things that we just pick up from our loved ones in our lives. It could be a, a grandparent, um, a dad, uh, you know, even even though, uh, like, for instance, uh, even though uh, I didn't spend like a lot, a lot of time with my dad, uh, when I did start spending spending time with my dad, uh, I realized that me and him have the same laugh. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but uh, that's kind of just what it is. But um, this next piece that I want to do for you all is. Uh, is me honoring uh, my past and honoring where I came from, me honoring my roots. Um, this is a piece about my grandfather. And uh, I hope that this piece also inspires you to look back into the, the your loved ones. And, um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to be related. You know, it could be your chosen family as well. Um, but the people in your life who you have, you have learned from and who have taught you how to love. Um, this piece is entitled Love for You. My granddaddy was a working man. He wore dicky jumpsuits with boots that were decorated with bits of each job he'd frequented his day to day. That's until my mom, my aunties, and uncles nagged him into something a little bit more comfortable, reluctant, but not opposed to it. Y'all, he would bust out a linen suit, the kind that came with shorts instead of pants. <laughs> he would throw on a Kango hat and, um, those slides with the, the checkerboard, the leather checkerboard stripes, uh, straps in the front instead of the back. And then I would watch as his, his stride became smooth like a, like a slick old alley cat. Now this was how my pop pop got comfortable. Now, when he wasn't working, he was somewhere either fishing or, or just cooling and eating. And sometimes you would even find him on some street literally across town, going somewhere and coming from everywhere. But somehow, right before the sun would start to set, he was already rooted on the front porch with a big old bag of pecans, probably a hidden stash that, that he and my granny had previously collected from uh, a, a, pre a previous bounty that he and my granny collected from the two pecan trees that they planted in the yard. Now, when I was younger, they would say, we planted those trees way before you would even thought of. But I often found my granddad there, right there on the front porch, whistling at the birds as they joyfully snatched blackberries from vines coiling around the diamonds of the wire fence. He was right there, 
shucking empty shells at them, chanting loudly, y'all better save some for me. Cracking more pecans in his palms with, with flesh as hard as steel drums. The whole family knew where to find him at this time. Enjoying the, the cadences of crickets and cicadas like them, he was present and hidden, intently waiting for the sky to change colors and enjoying his slice of patio peace. Uh, a home away from home since every room in his home was currently filled with little human screams, hardworking women chatting while rolling greens, and men jumping to old junk shops on the TV screen, and he was quiet and content. He was, he was happy with staying behind the scenes. Now, when you spoke to him, his eyes would grow wide, and tiny wounds inside of his irises would reveal themselves. You were now locked inside of his planetary gaze. His gravity would, would pull at your innermost thoughts, making it easy to give up anything you were hoarding. And as a young kid, I would give in quickly and finally let go. Um, Pop, Pop, Mama said to come ask you for $5 so I can go to the Thrill Lady. Now, uh, uh, in Savannah, we call them the Thrill Lady. Uh, other areas, they might call them the Candy Lady. How many of y'all had Candy Ladies in the neighborhood? <laughs> no, no Candy Ladies? Okay, so. Um, so, um, but what's with head to? He would spew out a foreign language, definitely made up, right before giving you a pecan, a $5 bill, and a funny look that told you to stay safe. I would nod my head, overstanding his request, and thanked him before walking away, now determined to crack that pecan in my hand. <laughs> now, y'all, at the time, $5 was just enough to get me, my sister, and my cousin some thrills. Now, thrills, those are like uh, ice cups. Uh, y'all ever seen like ice, ice, uh, like popsicles? Um, yeah, but uh, they just make them at home. So uh, at that time, $5 was enough to get me, my sisters, and my cousins some thrills. Plus, I would have enough left over to get a sandwich bag filled with a handful of five-cent chews. I don't think they make five-cent uh, candy no more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and y'all, I was definitely going to spend this $5 in one place, but I knew my granddaddy wouldn't mind because he had no problem telling us that this was the reason that he worked. You know, and, and this is... This is how he showed his love. And he loved his family a lot. And this home that he and my granny built was testament to that. Now, speaking of my granny, sometimes I used to think that he and my granny's love language was cursing at each other. It was at its strongest when she was cooking and he was hungry, which was weird because he was always hungry. <laughs> Y'all, he was a lanky 6'3 brown skin version of me. You would see him sneak around the corner, checking his left, then his right, before sliding over to a pot with steam seeping from underneath the vibrating top, it, y'all, it was, it was like a scene from an anime. Streams of color, huge dramatic music from invisible speakers, then here comes my granny just in time. Don't you touch my damn pot. My granddaddy, <laughs> shit, I thought you got lost in here. I got your loss. Now, with the quickest reflexes, my granny lifts up a large metal spoon from the stove, ready to stir up the situation and targets the top of his tango. She swings, he ducks, knowing that he was wrong. He smoothly ducks off in just enough time. But y'all, he keeps his word strong. You better hurry up in here, woman. You better shut up. <laughs> he says, God knows my heart. It was his signature phrase for every time he, he's being judged for expressing himself with colorful words. He would then retreat to one of his other known spots, a brown lazy boy that you could plug into the wall that nobody else could sit in. Y'all, it took three people to move this chair into the house. Now that he's relaxed, and just as the wrestling pre-show starts to wrap up, you hear, how many pieces of cornbread you want? <laughs> The moons in my Pop Pop's eyes would shine bright again upon hearing this scripture read from his white lips, probably borrowing more light from the same place that warmed the room when he was laughing and joking around. He is the first to get his plate. Then the kids, the uncles, the aunties, and my granny would finally sit down just to watch everybody eat those speak. And before I knew it, I had learned to speak a language a language that is reluctant to take off his work boots because there is always work to be done for the ones that you love. A language that knows how to set aside time to find peace, that isn't afraid to fight off the birds that will joyfully snatch at all the things in your life that are sweet. A language that teaches you how to get comfortable but never too comfortable. I've learned to speak language that is filled 
Only after it has successfully filled vacant tummies rioting from a lack of nutrients, a language that will pop you on your hand or your head if you ain't patient while God is cooking up your blessing, a language that will feed you, a language that will work for you. And y'all, please don't confuse what this is, because I am not up here reciting a poem. I am practicing writing songs in my love language with palms, still not quite strong enough to crack a pecan, but I'm still willing to do the work. Just know that when it gets hard, I can't promise that I won't use some colorful words, but it's fine. Because at the end of the day, God knows my heart. Mm -hmm. So, that was a piece entitled uh, Love Language. Uh, my granddad, um, he passed away, I want to say it was maybe about two years ago. Three? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I, I wanted to, uh, my, my granny, she's, she's only heard this piece once. Um, and my mom was supposed to be here today. Um, I guess she was, she was running a little late, um, but it's all good. Uh, but uh, I, like uh, the first time I, I read this piece uh, was in Barrow County um, and had the chance to read this piece for my granny and uh, like she, it was, uh, it, it was, it was really emotional because she came up to me afterwards and um, my granny, she's going through uh, dementia, uh, right? She has dementia right now. So her memory isn't all, all there, but after hearing the piece, um, she was able to like bring back some of these memories and say, hey, like I remember this and I remember this and I remember this. So, um, Again, the power of poetry and the power of words. All right, I'm going to do one more piece for us. And um, then that's going to be it. I want to open the floor for some questions, uh, comments, or anything else like that. We have some visitors. Ah, yes. May they come in? Yes. Come on. Hello. Hi. Everybody, this is my mother. Oh, and that's my hi. grandmother. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Oh, hey. appreciate y'all for coming. I know y'all uh, in virtual world, y'all can't see them, but you know, they they say hey too. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna be doing I'm gonna be doing this last poem um, for us, and this is kind of going back to our workshop. You know, earlier we talked about. Um, we talked about labels and how these labels have, have separated separated us as as a human race as as people in general. Um, so I wanted to uh, create a piece that kind of honors uh, our, our similarities and honors us coming together in situations like this because uh, this right now this is this is truly community uh, where people from all walks of life come together and we tell our stories and we start to find out that hey, um, we're not that different at all. Um, you know, yes, we, we may have, have had different labels attached to us that have led us on different paths in our life, but at the same time, we're, we're all still human. We all still bleed. We all still have dreams. We all still have passions and all of these other things. And those things are what can, what can bring us together. Um, so continuing to tell this story. So real quick, even if you don't have a drink, I want everybody to hold an imaginary drink in your hand. Um, if you are in virtual land, uh, you know, you've got a coffee cup, say, you know, I see the mugs, I guess. I'm loving the mugs. All right, and we're going to make a toast to happiness. And when we drink it, may our souls be filled with joy, fulfilled through the thrill of running up and down the hills of life in search of our very own paradise, a place where things like love, family, and health mean more than material things like wealth. Today, let us turn to the beginning of self, to lending hands to neighbors in need of help, to, to the good deeds are more than given. They are felt. Let us drink and be merry. Drink to the things that remain hidden just to eventually find that what we thought we needed, what we thought was missing, it was always present. So let us drink to life's lessons, to truly appreciate what we have now because this, us coming together is truly a blessing, right? And that's why we have to continue to come together to kill them all. Kill all of the labels, the colors, because we are all one and the same. So just love one another. Kill them all, I say. Kill them all, I pray. That one day, we the people, as just one race, will kill off hate and savor the taste of love, of love, of love. 
I drink. Wow. So, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And thank you all so much again. I know that was a long toast. So I, I saw some of your hands. <laughs> like, I'm tired. It's all right. So um, I want to open the floor for uh, for any questions that y'all may have uh, or um, anything that, that stuck out to you or um, just yeah, any any ideas, epiphanies, anything uh, like that. Um, you know, open the floor. I have a question. Yes. I have always wondered about uh, spoken word poets. They remember these long things. Is, is there, are there hints or tricks or, or, or what do I want to say, strategies for doing that? Yes. Uh, so, um, so it usually takes me to, to really get a poem like memorized, memorized. Um, to the point to where I can really start playing with it. So even if I mess up, I, I'll come up with like a hundred different ways to like bounce back into the poem. Um, it usually takes me about a good year to do that. Um, so even um, the granddaddy piece that I did for y'all, I was doing some of it from memory, but then I still had the paper here. And y'all see this paper that I've been doing. But uh, I still had the paper here just in case with my little uh, notes and everything on here too. Um, but uh, one strategy that I can definitely give is uh, one thing that I've been doing with this piece specifically is uh, memorizing one page at a time mm -hmm. uh, and breaking it up into sections. And if memorizing one page uh, mm -hmm. is too heavy for me, then I'll even break that and down and say, hey, I'm just going to memorize half the page. So that way, because this piece is it's four pages and it's just like, uh, when you look at it like I'm trying to memorize four pages, it, it, be, it, can, it can be kind of daunting. But then when you just say, hey, I'm just going to memorize half of this page, I um, want to do that. Um, something else I also do, uh, which my Keisha can tell you on the way up here, uh, after I write my poems, when I want to memorize them, I'll read them. I'll look at them and read them into a voice recorder so that way I can listen to them while I'm in the car. Uh, so literally sometimes when I'm in the car, I don't listen to the radio or anything else like that. I just turn my phones on and just listen to myself talk. Uh, so that, that happens a lot too. And then uh, there's some other tricks too, uh, which uh, it could be kind of complicated, but it's where you take, after you write the poem, it's already subconsciously in you. Uh, so what you do is to tap into that subconscious um, you write the first letter of mm -hmm. each word in the sentence. Mm -hmm. And then you go sentence by sentence. And with just those letters, you got to try and remember the whole sentence. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of forces you to remember it. And you're not necessarily looking at the exact word, but those words are just going to pop. It's, it's, it's like magic. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's weird the way it happens. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> Anybody else? So, so if, we, if I'm understanding you right, so you write the poem down and then you start to memorize it. Do you, you perform it as you're, uh, I mean, as you're trying to memorize it or do you take a whole year and then you perform it like after you've written it a year? Yeah, so that's that's a very good question. Um, so I, um, I learned this uh, process um, from a poet, uh, his name is Ed Mabry. Um, he's one of the, like, he's from North Carolina. Um, and he's in, uh, He's in California now, uh, but he's one, like, he's known for being the, like, poet who has won the most slam uh, poetry competitions in the world. Like, he is that good. Uh, I, I have had the opportunity to sit in a couple of workshops with him um, and work with him, and we brought him down to Savannah and everything. Uh, but uh, something he, uh, that he taught us, a process that has really stuck with me for my, uh, during, during my whole career, is uh, this process of writing with the door closed, writing with the door cracked, writing with the door open, and then stepping outside of that door, mm -hmm. all right? So uh, the process is you write with the door closed. Uh, when you're writing with the door closed, this means nothing can get in, even your own thoughts. A lot of times when we write, we stop ourselves from writing certain things because we're just like, oh, this is stupid, or hey, um, I'm writing about dogs right now and this line about butterflies just popped in my head. Um, I'm going to discard this line about butterflies because it has nothing to do. I'm, I'm writing about dogs right now, mm -hmm. all right? So we block all of those out because the door is closed. If, uh, if one second you're writing about butterflies and then on the next line, all of a sudden you're talking about dogs, you allow that to happen. 
All right, so right with the door closed, it's almost like a stream of consciousness. Every, any, anything goes. There is no such thing as a bad thought in that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, then you write with the door cracked. This is when you start allowing some of those thoughts to come in. So some of those thoughts that are just like, hey, um, you shouldn't have wrote that, or hey, like maybe you should change this, tweak this a little bit, or hey, um, this person might think this about this line, or this person might think. You start letting those little ideas kind of sneak in, but not too much. You don't want it to be influenced too much. After that, then you open the door. You open the door wide open. When you open the door wide open, sometimes, especially if you're in the house and you got siblings, if that door open, that sibling, they're going to walk by or they might come right on in, all right? So this is the opportunity um, where you allow people around you. So uh, people around you, to you let them start hearing the piece. You allow them to step into the editing room with you and give their opinion. So now you're allowing outside opinions to come into that room, all right? The last process is stepping outside of the door. That is the performance part. And um, these pieces uh, also go, which y'all can kind of see, um, is this, these uh, little edits that I have on here are come from performance revision. Um, so I have marks out, I've switched things around, um, I've read things out. Um, so this is why it takes so long for me to do my pieces because even after I do my piece, I'm still thinking about, okay, hey, how did the audience react to this part? Or how did it feel building up to this part? Is there something I need to do here for, for more clarity? So this is where I really start to turn the piece, not into a spoken word piece, but turn the piece into a conversation where I'm just up here talking to you all. I'm, I'm trying to make this piece feel natural and not rehearsed. Um, and then from there, the process starts all over again. After I have went through the door closed, the door cracked, the door open and it stepped outside of the door, I go right back into the room, I shut the door and I go right back into the editing process and it continues again. Um, somebody said it earlier, I'm not sure, um, but as my Keisha, I think it was you, um, who talked about how uh, humans are weird in a, a constant state of change. Um, and I also believe that our pieces should be in a state of change as well. They should grow just as much as we grow. Um, so if I'm a poem that, I'm, that I wrote when I was 16, I can still write, I can still do that poem, but it's important for me as an artist to go back and reflect on that poem and say, what have I learned or what would I change or what would I do different from, um, from this now? Or what have I learned different? What can I add in here now that I've uh, you know, grown and had new experiences? So that's why you feed off the audience. Like, like if, yes. as, as you're building, and then there's somebody in the audience that goes, well, mm -hmm. then that just, that's like, you, you incorporate all of that every time or? Yes, okay. Yeah, because that, that allows me to know where the pauses are going to be, or maybe I didn't have a pause in a certain place and I sped over a part and then somebody did go, well, <laughs> and it's like, I talked over them, so it's like, okay, hey, I know next time I do this, I need to pause a little longer after I do this line because people really, they really fuck with that line. So um, that's kind of what that process is like. Got any other questions? And y'all can pop them in the chat too. I got the, uh, the chat pulled up. Uh, I see Jill Jennings uh, said, lots of internal rhyme uh, used to great effect. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for pronouncing pecan the right way. Look, <laughs> I, uh, I, I side our people who say pecan. Um, I mean, but you know, that's just like uh, in Savannah, we say uh, praline, but of course in New Orleans, they say uh, the praline. Of the, yeah, so, yeah. you know. Houston and Houston. Yeah. <laughs> Words. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, cool. Well, so, I mean, um, are, are we, we all good? No, no other questions. All right. Well, I, no, I, I appreciate y'all for, uh, I, uh well, first of all, oh, go ahead, George. I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. I had a question. I was waving my hand madly. But... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I guess in this little square, uh, it's hard to recognize everything. I, I was taking notes as you were talking and reading and reciting. And one of the things you said is uh, our marinate, marinated in our lived experiences. And I wanted you to talk about that a little bit because I see poets yeah. as being the ultimate observer. 
yes, exactly. Yes, um, this, this marinated oh, yeah, that, experience that whole, uh, is, I can um, explain so that. that way I, can. I said, uh, I need that organic, marinated and lived experiences. I needed, needed like dough in the mind's kitchen and set aside to rise on a notepad. So uh, marinated and lived experiences. Um, as uh, when I was younger, uh, I definitely went through, uh, and still even to this day sometimes, I uh, go through imposter syndrome with, with being a poet. And um, there was a another poet that I looked up to who um, was talking to me and was just like, you know, hey, um, everything has, like everything that exists, it exists. Um, there is no, there's really no way for us to create anything new. And um, don't try and stress, your out, stress yourself out by trying to create something new. What you need to do is just tell your truth and tell your story and people will automatically gravitate to it. Um, the people who are supposed to be touched by your story, the people who are, are meant to be in your lives, or the people who are just meant to hear your stories, um, that's who it's going to gravitate to. So when we say marinated and lived experiences, uh, every time you get up on a mic or any time that you write, you are making sure that you're coming from a perspective that you can, um, coming from a perspective that you can identify with in some form or fashion. Now, of course, we do have um, instances where we have um, people writing about experiences that, um, that they didn't necessarily go through. But as the writer, it is still your responsibility to do the research, to talk to people who have actually been through these things. So that way you can even see how they feel about it. And then it may even add, uh, it'll add nuance to your piece and add layers to your piece that people will be able to connect to more because it is lived experiences and it's something that people have actually been through. Thank you. All right. in the chat. All right, so we got Rose. Uh, Rose said, use poetry, using poetry as a therapeutic tool, should you let the influences in? Isn't it important to express what you feel? Yes, um, and that's why uh, there is a process to, uh, uh, there is a point in the process when you should let you should let your influences influence you. Uh, because right even right now, we're being influenced. We're constantly being influenced. We, even the colors and just everything, like the, this world is all about influencing the consumers, honestly, um, if, we, if we wanna be real. So we're always being influenced by these things. So uh, those influences are going to come through regardless. And that's why I would say put more emphasis on trying not to uh, let those influences change anything um, because those influences are naturally going to come through. Um, so that's kind of just my, my take on that. But yeah, poetry is a great therapeutic tool though. Um, uh, most artists, unfortunately, uh, we, I, I'm sure we all know the saying that like great art comes out of pain or comes out of trauma and all those other things and um i don't necessarily believe that all the great uh the, the great stuff came out of trauma um however because poetry has been activated as a tool in um helping people to reflect on their own lives and uh finding the good in in the bad or finding the the rainbow in the rain um like that's, you know, that's, that's what poetry uh, has the power to do. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay, Rose said she, uh, she was saying uh, that she shouldn't, that you shouldn't let the, uh, allow the influences in. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I, I still, like I said, I still think there is a point where you, you should let them in, um, let the influences in. Um, Why, does Rose have, have a poem she's gonna share in the open mic? To emphasize that point? What? Your yes. Story, you share the one for us? Yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Can't wait to hear that. <laughs> what, are, are you talking about as far as the um, influences? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so far, far as the influences then. Okay. Say it again. There's far as, the, far as the influences, there is one that I can share. 
Okay, yeah, we'll, uh, so we're, we're going to uh, get ready to go into the open mic portion and everything. Uh, so we'll uh, be able to have everybody uh, start sharing and everything there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to pass it back over to Ms. Lucinda, and then uh, we'll, we'll go from there to get this open or break. Yeah, well, okay. well actually, I was going to say, I mean, you've got everybody emotionally rolling. I'm just going to the break. Let's just, let's just <laughs> go forward. <laughs> let's go. Well, I'm going to say, first of all, Marquise, thank you so much, everybody. We know that you, uh, you, you provide us with a workshop. We wouldn't let you come uh, empty, go back empty-handed. So we've uh, we've got a, a gift here for you. Um, it's um, it's actually uh, all of the Reach of Song series, yes. so that you can uh, actually take them and share with Savannah, just like you've uh, shared here. And uh, uh, we so appreciate lunch. You all found the location, and lunch will be immediately following. Thank you so much Thank you. for coming. Yes. So everybody, again, working is good. Okay. Now I've got a I've got a signal. Five percent is really low for the battery. Okay, right. So I'm going to be plugging in. But in the meantime, what I would like to do is um, uh, make a, a couple of announcements as we're gearing up for the open mic. Because if you have something to read, uh, I want you to put put your name in the chat so that we can actually either alternate from the visual, from uh, from visual, what we call the virtual, to live. Because there's some there's some poets here who have actually read their work and they they should not leave without having to share uh, the stage today. So okay, I see I see you all adding names to the chat. And so, and so while I'm going to do two for one, and Marquise, you had you mentioned shirts, shirts. Yes, yes. Okay. So okay. while so I'm while plugging in, in, can I do this from here? This is what you call a technical <laughs> workout <laughs> because if you go zero, it will go dark, right? Okay. All the old people shaking their heads in the room. Don't, don't, don't do that. So I'm going to move this up a little bit. And while we're doing that, Marquise, please come on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please come on. Uh, I did. Uh, so uh, I did. Uh, I do, uh, I do uh, shirts for sale that you can take home with you today if you would like. Okay. There we go. There we go. All right, uh, based, based on uh, uh, poetry, poetry. Uh, so if y'all would like to go home today with a poetry shirt, uh, you're able to do that. Um, and then uh, also as well, um, we'll be adding more uh, shirts uh, coming out soon as well too. So uh, y'all can also visit my website. If you don't purchase one today, uh, you'll be able to go to the website and purchase one from the website as well. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, these are shirts, we have them in black and we have them in this burgundy uh, maroon-ish color. Um, so yes, come on. Now you gotta come back here in front of the plug in. Oh, yep, you're right. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, yes, y'all can grab y'all a Feed Me Poetry shirt inspired by the poem Feed Me Poetry. You know the other colors because the people that Oh, yeah, oh, that's right. You're doing that one. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you can just go in front of the. Oh, well, yeah, I got you. I bought yeah. one in. Uh, yeah. And so, what we're gonna do is this. Yep. Yeah, I'll Boom, here y'all go. We got the Feed Me Poetry. If y'all enjoy the poem, you can oh, wear the shirt. We're going to get some uh, some chef hats. How much? Uh, <laughs> yeah, how oh, much? Twenty dollars. Only twenty dollars. Oh, that's so reasonable. It's practically free, y'all. Wow. Okay. All right. So I I, I see that we are um, filling up the chat room. I'm gonna check real quick to see if those are people signing up. Um. Let's see. That's a uh, touch of rose. Okay. Uh, is that Jill? Are you trying? Oh, you have the name of your poem. Is that the name of your poem? I'm just just put a, a thumb a thumbs up. Yeah, okay, I'll read my poem. Yes. All right. So what I'm going to do because I I felt so inspired by all that I learned today here in the workshop. I didn't get a chance to share the um, the thoughts that I had uh, written from the workshop, and so I thought he said write a poem, but now that you've explained how the spoken word part uh, works, I'm gonna read what I wrote mm -hmm. from what you, shared, what, what you shared earlier today. Um, I don't have a title or anything like that. It's just a poem that I, uh, that I wrote down. It says, what am I without my current labels? I am, I give no stress, no preset responsibilities, 
just growth, just a better world, just we sharing, find, finding our way. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to take one here and then we're going to go to virtual. Who wants to go first? I know. I, I went first. I, I went first. <laughs> <laughs> this is painful. <laughs> okay. okay. Can this? Sure. Okay. All right. So we're going to just just one or two set rules because we they, they've got us on a clock here. When you come up, introduce okay. yourself. And um, if we are really, everybody's really whistling and hollering, you get two. Okay. If everybody's just kind of get one. So that's fair enough? Fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Okay, next, we're gonna have Kansas, come on up. Woo! All right, Hi everyone, I'm Candace Kelsey. Um, I'm gonna be reading from uh, my most recent book, um, which deals with the concept of labels, for as you can see, a girl, a woman, a teacher, a poet. Um, and this first poem um, is, uh, deals with my, my grandmother, um, but in a different way maybe than um, Marquis dealt with the, the memories of his uh, grandfather. Um, this is called A Girl Remembers Whale Sharks and Bell Hooks. A girl passed out while diving with whale sharks at the Georgia Aquarium when she was celebrating her 15th birthday. Her father was in the tank with her, as was the largest fish in the world, an ovoviviparous creature whose embryo is formed within the egg, which then hatches in the mother's uterus. The young are released into the sea fully formed. Litters can be more than 300 pups. But even weirder is that their teeth point backwards and their spot patterns are as unique as human fingerprints. The girl had a cold that day and trouble breathing in her mask. It's remarkable to think of her vulnerability, like an astronaut floating in the atmosphere. They pulled her out and she was fine after they gave her a splash of cold air and a shake. She remembered her grandmother in Scranton who barely spoke English and stood in her kitchen for hours rolling cabbage while she sat in the back seat of a woody station wagon coloring her best picture to give her, a grandmother who had barely spoken to her for the 10 short years of her life. It was a deep sea scene from National Geographic's Magnificent Ocean coloring book. Her companion on the 12 hour haul across Ohio through the Pennsylvania Turnpike, chewing gum and scented markers and the hope of a grandmother's love. When they moved to the backyard to sit under the clothesline, she braved the walk toward Grandma Baelish, picture in hand. She looked at it and nodded and then handed it back to her. She remembers wanting to swim like a whale shark deep into the temperate waters and away from the humiliation. Today, she is 51. She reads a post on Twitter about a grandmother who gave her grandchildren all the pictures they had made for her. She had them in garbage bags, one for each child. The overwhelming response was warmth and awe that this grandmother had kept the artwork so long and returned it out of love. She weeps. In a way, her own mother has handed her garbage bags of the stuff she kept over the years. This woman has stored them in her body. A hatred for her thighs and belly, disgust for her arms, the need for male attention. Women like Bell Hooks helped her take out that trash. She carried a slip of paper in her wallet the past 25 years. If any female feels she need anything beyond herself to legitimate and validate her existence, she is already giving away her power to be self-defining her agency. These are the words Bell Hooks gave this woman and a generation of women tired of giving themselves to people who looked, nodded, and handed them back. A young girl's heart is an ovoviviparous creature. It gives. And it gives endless litters of love until it realizes the embryos hatch inside itself. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do the B, B. Arthur or? Uh, yes, B. Arthur. B. Arthur. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm okay. a huge Broadway fan. <laughs> um, okay. So here, oh, here it is. This is um, one more, a little more lighthearted. 
Um, okay, a girl thinks of B. Arthur's stare. For a room or 23 seconds in Maine at the Winter Garden on Broadway toward bosom buddy Angela Lansbury for describing her age as somewhere between 40 and death is nothing compared to the Wilkinson daggers my mother and her sisters throw some days at the Oleo restaurant and bar like daughters of Zeus, not discussing art, but brands and shades of hair dye. <laughs> Study the masters, Lucille Clifton tells us, how I've studied her and Trethaway and Law and watching their labor, inviting the craft to sing in me. Also, I study my mother and her sisters. I have learned to run from them. Unlike Kwame Dawes' approach to poetry, I run to it, he explains in a workshop. Beverly asked for an honest answer from Donnie, Debbie, and Jeannie after too much Riesling. Is my hair a shade too blonde? <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, now one from the virtual world. Um, rose, touch a rose. Ready? Yes. Can you mute yours? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so this is from my book, um, Let Me Touch You Through Life Seasons. And when we talked about um, kind of influences, so I picked out this one is called Individuality. We wear anything, no matter how wild. The only thing that is important is if it's in style. Our hair, our clothes, and even our feet. It seems there's no concern for what looks neat. I wonder sometimes where we are headed and if what we are doing will one day be regretted. Tell me, what are the lessons we are leaving behind? It surely is not to be one of a kind. So if everyone is doing it, does that make it okay? Or could there perhaps be a better way? I'm thinking now, what should I do? Should I just be myself? Or should I try to be like you? <laughs> that was the end of that one. <laughs> I can't hear. Oh, okay. Do you, do you have one more? I, say that again. Do you have one more? Yes. Okay. I used to work with um, women who were on welfare and I trained them to um, get better jobs and work better with their families. So this one I dedicated to the shift program, which was a program that worked with women. And this one is called Take the Journey. <clears throat> Take the Journey. Sometimes we start out in a different place. No matter how hard we try, we lose the race. Days can be long, yet sunny and bright. You'll find yourself praying all day and then again at night. Learning new things and being told what to do can be really tough, but look at what it's done for you. You are a strong woman with strength to grow. Lady, you can fit in wherever you go. So take this journey and give it your all because what's the most important is that you answer the call. Thank you. Lynn? Me? Lynn Farmer, yep. Okay. Oh, great. Lynn? That doesn't look good. <laughs> Something looks frozen. Go home. Wait, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Lynn, we're having a hard time. Disturbed. Here. Disturbed in routines, mostly quiet with age. One strapped loosely in an easy chair, reclined for mealtimes ebb and flow with no response, only the quiver of his throat, the obligation of his wrinkled shedding lips to receiving and sending much of supper he had not heard. 
low teams in whining wheelchairs, their bony arms commanding muscles stretched from shoulders hunch to hands of steel poised for escape, looked up in scattered unison and bright reaction to the clatter of a cereal dish, declined, sent away from flattened taste that still remembered somewhere in the dark, spring picnics and candlelit libations, far back within a folded memory, invisible and put away. Another one tested scornfully his onions stretched with squash and the adhesive shoe tough flesh too dense for pasty gnawing. He swallowed hard, then loudly spurned it all, shrieking to one washed in glaring white to send this tray back to the kitchen, swapping out for something more presentable, anything digestible or barely succulent. My grandmother, Grace, looked at me and looked herself completely out of place, turning her head, lowering her eyes. At 93, embarrassed for those younger, captured in their intermittent light, their hands curled toward their wrists in time, their eyes clouded with things they wished they'd never seen. She could not wait for Tuesday when she'd leave the nursing home. She'd lost her appetite. The hall finally rejected this meal of mucilage, refusing now to dine, confirmed to wheel, confined to wheelchairs, lazy boys or soured pajamas, denying close the frame of fractured family with mind attuned to every fall, releasing scheduled order to the chaos of complaint, discarding common sustenance that neither fed nor filled. only broken bodies and just my kiss as I rose quickly tearing out into a night young only to consumptive chill. True story. Anyone else? Jill. Jill. Jill and George. Okay, I can hear you now. <clears throat> Jill and George. Uh, <clears throat> I'm from Fort Myers, Florida the city that was halfway wiped off the earth. Um, and so you think about location. Here's a poem I wrote a few years back called Location. And it's from my second book, Dead Man's Flower, which is the, the name the Hawaiians give for the plumeria. I used to live in Hawaii. Location. A thing is not a thing. A person is not a person. People who made me are already ash and grit. They did not endure. The things I own will not endure. I will not endure. A sky will always be a shade of mauve or blue or orange or white, but it will be there. A tree will have learned to bend so it doesn't have to break. Though it seems to disappear, the sun will never abandon a single spot on earth. Place is the only thing that remains. No matter how much they change, places are always there. A tornado or a hurricane and people flee, but they come back to stand in the rubble and say, this was my bathroom. This is where I hid. This is where the tub was. This is where we laid down my child under me, my hands locked around his tiny chest. We look and see nothing of what used to be there. Only a survivor 
standing at an address with no numbers, smiling at a pile of sheetrock and broken concrete. His house, this place. Um, have you got time for another one? Sure. This is called The Dead Never Leave Us. The dead never leave us. They sit in the front parlors of memory like old women counting, knit one, furl one. The dead never leave us. Words we spoke to them echo through the halls of regret like high-heeled footsteps receding down a waxed corridor. The dead never leave us. The gifts they gave us, the Lalit figurine, the Rockingham teapot. They get up and run around the room laughing, bouncing on the sofa whenever the house is dark and quiet. The dead never leave us. They've entered their dates on our phones. Last anniversary, last birthday, last day. Program to pop up year after year. So the dead never leave us. We welcome their ghosts into a photo booth at the arcade, show them how to pose for candid shots that we will never be able to throw away. Thank you. George, are you next? I guess. I got a message that says I was. Uh, I've been working on some portraits of people that I knew that influenced me one way or the other without saying how they influenced me, but, but trying to address who they were and what they meant to the people around them. And this is a poem uh, based on a woman I met when I was living in Africa in 1962. And uh, she was uh, an amazing woman. Her name meant uh, bird who calls. So that's what I call the poem, bird who calls. She is neither the color of fired brick nor mud, but brown tan by hundreds of days planting rice in the sun. Her back straight, arm sinewy, thin with age, forearms like leather, fingers almost skeletal, she pages through the magazine my wife gave her and marvels at the translucent skin of the models, their blue eyes, straight blonde hair, their red glossy lips, straight white teeth. The models are immodest, their legs bare, allowing men to touch their shoulders, kiss their lips. She's immodest, hair covered in a colorful head tie, her torso wrapped in a long lapa, her legs covered by a second, a skirt made of a single layer of cloth wrapped around. She is the Paramount Chief's sister. She's important, but she knows us as friend. She is regal, tall, walks gracefully. She isn't arrogant and keeps order quietly. She watches over her nephews and nieces pronouncing directions and inhibitions in monosyllables. When we misunderstand her, she calls for someone, someone to translate our English into her bande. During afternoon conversation, she likes to sit and drink tea, two sugars. When offered more, she waves away the pot. Not enough, one is enough, just as she doesn't overindulge her charges, overindulge her charges. If they want a drink, she gives them a cup of tea or water. She does not wear a crown, but she is regal, loyal, and royal, subject to none, subject to all. She minds children. She is more powerful than her brother, for she has trained minds and shaped personalities of those who will come to replace him. Anyone 
anyone else? Anybody else from virtual world? Okay. Back to you. you. Okay. All right. Switch. Switch. Okay. Got coming up. Right? Yep. Okay. Um, I got divorced after 30 years. And uh, so some of these poems are in here, but I hope some of them are funny. <laughs> <laughs> His and hers, the last laundry. Oh, you cursed shirts. Just when we're dividing, you have spun into each other's arms. Mm been fused to a lump in one, a centrifuged stasis that can't be undone. Oh, Oxford Claw, I divorced thee. I divorced thee. I divorced thee thrice. No longer will your lost buttons or ring around the collar be mine. <laughs> My last act of kindness will be to drop you at the Korean shop to be steamed and pressed back to your chosen persona, who is persona non grata around here. Get your French cup sleeves off my aqua v-neck tee. <laughs> She's looking tired. She's drooping out of shape. She's going into the dryer without you. She will be conditioned. She will tumble in a breeze. She's going to fluff. Oh. <laughs> You know, as a poet, I admire metaphor. That's really the basis of it. And when those shirts came out of the dryer, I thought, well, Trish, if you're a poet, you need to make a poem. Yeah, this. Uh, this one is another one in that same laundry room. It took me six months to clean it out. You know, when you've lived in a place for 30 years, there's a lot. Your emergency blankets. Here lie the wool throw, scratchy plaid, once placed by your Aunt Dot in the trunk of the jalopy you drove to college. The Navajo print, machine wrought in man made collars, given by your brother Scott in one of his good years. And the heather gray wool, whip stitched in orange. From Dot's last sedan, the one she gave me when she forgot how to drive. They spent lifetimes waiting in the dark for roadside disaster to lend them purpose. Perhaps jealous of umbrellas and ice scrapers more often called up for service. Their cars have all been seated or sold, but I loathed to surrender to strangers what your family chose. They're still on duty in our laundry room, ready, stacked. Now that our joint venture is shot, this house must empty. My time as steward of your relics is done. These blankets are goodwill bound. May they become gifts, host picnics, find a warm body to serve. Oh, uh, this is a little chat book. Uh, the Georgia Poetry Society published it two years ago. Uh, it won their little chat book contest. It's called Awake with Low Slung Moon. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank, I always thank Stephen Shields, who was the president and also did the chat book that year uh, for doing such a nice job with uh, the publication of this mm -hmm. book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Am I getting it in the right place? There you go. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, tell me about the rest of the books. I was going to say, Trish, Trish is very modest. She is actually our bookstore manager. And do uh, you want to tell them how they can get the uh, uh, books, uh, Reach of Song, or how to order? Yeah, yeah, you know, we have um, our annual anthologies, and I also have um, about five or six or seven years of the winning chat books available. They're listed on our website. Um, and you can find them in the bookstore there. That sort of 
creates a ping pong effect of um, it sends a message to a site where I look at the and then I can mail you a book and uh, you can pay through PayPal on the site. Um, okay. So or you can send me a check. Okay. All right. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Mm -hmm. Anyone here in the room feeling inspired? Not yet. Okay, we've got one in virtual. Um, okay, someone is asking, uh, Jill is asking, can you tell us about the deadline for the poetry contest for GPS? Okay, we'll get to that. Well, well, first we're gonna officially close the open mic. Going, going, gone. All right, so now we're moving to the next thing, which is, uh, um, uh, I wanna say, uh, organization business, and I'll get to your question, Jill. But first, uh, yes, yes, they want your shirts. Marquise, they are <laughs> in this. So to get the uh, Marquise's t-shirts or books, did you bring any? Uh, of no, them? I didn't bring, uh, but for all of that, uh, it just if they just give me their email address, okay. I can contact them personally. Okay, Marquise is saying that if you uh, send, did you, you want us to collect them here? Yes, please. Okay, we will collect in the chat. If you are interested in getting the t-shirts, we've got it in red here. Black. And then we've got it in black. Where, where's the one in black? <coughs> it's called, it says "Feed Me Poetry." Yes, please. I've got my model here. Who's going to show me? Hello, good. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're interested in any of, the, uh, if you haven't ordered your uh, copy of Reach of Song 2021, we go all the way back to, what's it? Uh, I think, uh, oh, well, yeah, just look at the website, but it goes back about at least 10 years, maybe more. Okay, well, um, we've got them here, and now you've seen Trish, and so you can, uh, you can uh, place an order. Uh, we're now going to have does that answer everyone's questions? Uh, Jill's question uh, regarding the uh, contest. Uh, Jill, we're going to get back to you about the Reach of Song contest. I have uh, received an email that that should be up and running. Um, once our chair steps up, our chair for the contest steps up, you'll be getting those emails. So chair for the contest, uh, you're going to have to give us a call so we can get those emails. Um, next. Uh, okay, so there's some orders in the, in the chat for you. Uh, anyone else with a question? Okay, George, take it away. Uh, uh, because George is the vice president and all meetings, all meetings, uh, future meetings for 2023 are gonna be handled uh, by George. Hi. Uh, I want to thank everybody who participated in the meeting, and especially our presenter, Marquise Williams. It was very inspiring and very helpful and very instructive. Uh, Tish talked about the books, the availability of the books through the bookstore, through the website. And uh, if you haven't gotten your copy of the Reach a Song yet, you need to do that. It is inspiring to read our fellow colleagues, poems, and, uh, and thoughts. Uh, the next meeting will be in January, the second Saturday in January. I don't have my calendar with me, but I think it's the Jan January 14th. I'm not sure. Uh, it will be at uh, Agnes Scott College. And uh, it, they have a lovely space there for us to use. Uh, we have the space from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So I'm working on the program now and try to pack it with as much poetry as possible. If you have suggestions about poets that you would like to have uh, come to, uh, to the meeting to be a part of our program, you can email me through the website at, uh, I think it's VP or Vice President uh, GeorgiaPoetrySociety.org or just directly to me at MacbethGeorge.gmail.com uh, and I'll put my email address again in the, in the chat room. I want to thank everybody for who participated in the meeting and making this a success. Uh, it really depends on you what we do. So uh, 
looking forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Uh, as far as I know, it's going to be an in-person meeting at Agnes Scott. So it'll be in the Atlanta area and we can bring in more people, hopefully, and uh, keep our verses going. Thank you. Um, to pay dues, you can do it on the website by using PayPal, um, or you can mail a check to our treasurer who is Donna Rose Mulcahy. Um, if those instructions are not up on our web, I'll make sure that we I, I contact Marion and ask him to put it up there. But it's, it's um, up there because I recently had to get it. Yeah, a, it's an it's not up form. there and not a word about about the contest and the you know, I was a little concerned about that Ooh, because the deadline's November 15th year. So see. Who's that? Lynn Farmer. Okay. Can you All turn right. your volume up there? Okay. Lynn, um, everything is kind of either echoing or we can't hear very well, but... Um, I can hear you now. Great. Yes. Yeah, under contact us on the... Under uh, contact on the us on the website, it yeah. has Donna's address, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Donna's address will be there. And then about the contest, who's running them this year, or do we have any? It seems like maybe there's nobody in charge of it from what she I said. I think that might be. We're having a, a volunteer shortage. Um, well, no, yeah. actually, we're waiting on you, Jill. We're waiting <laughs> on you. Uh, you're, you're the one who's keeping us, keeping us up in, uh, in check about that. So when you're ready. <laughs> Sure. Thank you all. Thank you all. And and Trish, I loved your poems as always. Oh, thanks, Lynn. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. So one more. All right. So if there are no other questions, comments, concerns, um, board of directors, we are going to, you're going to receive a separate email. We are going to take our board meeting um, via Zoom. Be on the lookout for the email for that. Once again, we want to thank you, Marquise for coming out and making this a wonderful. Thanks, Lucinda. Thanks, everyone. Schrader, who, because you, because you are who you are, you kept everybody sane and stable and listened in Augusta. We must thank our hosts. Because those people in the virtual world cannot appreciate where we are. It is a beautiful, beautiful facility. And if you if you are in the Augusta area or you get a chance to run, come by, make sure you stop in the hub or look us up on or look it up online. It's a beautiful facility. So thank Thanks you for again coming. for that. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. And so without further ado, if there's nothing else, George, we're gonna go to lunch. <laughs> okay, enjoy your lunch. All right. So, everyone, thank you. Thank you for coming out. We'll thank see you, you next time.